Thank you for tuning in to the best parenting show on the internet. Post Daily Dose. Hey there, Post Institute. This is Christy Sell, the co-founder, coming at you live with the best little parenting show on the internet, the Post Daily Dose. I hope everybody is doing fine and dandy this evening. Uh, it's short sleep weather. That makes me kind of happy. I got my Choose Love t-shirt on. We actually, I have a friend who is working on some new graphics for us, and we're going to gonna have some t-shirts and I think maybe some coffee mugs and some stickers and all kinds of fun stuff so yeah because you know let's make it fun let's wear our love let's be proud oh my goodness okay so I told you guys that I can see sometimes it'll tell me names of who's watching even if they don't say hi and I see Roberta Hinman and uh, I hadn't seen you in a long time love but Every time I see your name or every time I hear from you, I just have this huge place in my heart where I just feel like I'm wrapping you in a big hug and I know I am getting one back. So thank you for watching. Everybody who's tuned in, thank you so much. Anybody who wants to say hi, feel free. I'm going to plug these books real quick from Fear to Love. You can get it on promotion, feartolovebook.com. We have this great workbook. Right here, you can get it in print on Amazon. You can get it as an ebook on our website, postinstitute.com. And then this one right here, The Great Behavior Breakdown. I do have From Fear to Love and The Great Behavior Breakdown put together as a little bundle. And uh, we also have discounts for people who want to order in bulk. And uh, I always like to work with agencies or people who are wanting to gift books to others. Um, so you're, anytime, you're welcome to shoot me an email and we'll see what we can work out for a win-win for your agency. Um, so we have been talking, um, uh, back at you, Roberta. We have been talking about sexualized behavior in children. Actually, we've been talking about the statistics of sexual abuse so far. So we're just taking it one little step at a time. And last night, I went through a whole lot of statistics and I've been thinking about some of them like all day long, like all day long I've been thinking about this. And here's one thing that I wanted to come back to because it really, it kind of got my brain going, what? So uh, one of the statistics says that children living without either parent, and in this article, and this article is also connected to several other articles. So this specific research from Sedlak et al., 2010, is research that is cited in several articles and it uses that phrase children living without either parent and in parentheses it says foster children are 10 times more likely to be sexually abused than children that live with both biological parents so because i work with so many families uh, so many adoptive families and then, of course, went to see if there's any research related to the frequency of sexual abuse happening in adoptive placements. And there's not any. There's like no articles. Uh, I came across one article. It wasn't really even an article. It was just a listing of all of the cases of child sexual abuse. Not all, but several that had occurred in adoptive placements. So I think it's interesting that there's not a lot of information out there about that, and yet we know it happens. I uh, also couldn't find any information about the frequencies of sexual abuse occurring in orphanages. And I know that definitely happens. Um, I know several children um, personally um, that that has been the case. So I find it, it kind of, honestly, when that kind of thing happens, then in my mind, I also begin to look at everything in this article and go, hmm, hmm. Because then I started thinking about how vigilant and probably my own transference about being a single mother and reading that children who live with single parents that have a live-in partner are at, a, are at the highest risk. They are 
20 times more likely to be the victims of child sexual abuse than children living with both biological parents. But it makes me let go, well, so why did I get so focused on that? And what does that 20 times more likely mean? And we're comparing this to both biological parents and it's kind of making it sound like if you're raised with both your biological parents, you're not very likely to experience child sexual abuse. And we all know that that's not correct either. So as you read information and you're letting things percolate, I think it's important when those little question marks come up that you go, now oh, wait a minute, let's go back and think about that a little bit more. The other thing that I found myself really thinking about is that statistic, that retrospective reporting that says one in four females and one in six males report being sexually abused before the age of 18. That is a 2006 report. And yet, and, and then the, the whole picture of these, uh, of the facts of people who, who family structures, economic situations, ethnicity, all these things that uh, are cited as increasing the likelihood, two times more likely if you live in a rural community, three times more likely if you're from a, so a lower socioeconomic class. Um, let's see, there was one that talked about if you're not, a uh, parent's not in the workforce, the risk of sexual abuse is tripled for children whose parents are not in the labor force. So I found all that really interesting and I'm definitely going to go check out the full study that Sedelac, S-E-D-L-A-C-K, did. Um, and I'm not saying that this isn't accurate, but I'm definitely going to want to read into it because um, I've worked in the field of mental health, working with families, working in families' homes uh, for over 30 years. And... I've worked with probably at least 200 people who have shared and disclosed to me a history of sexual abuse and none of them fit that criteria. So I know that there are lots of people that may not have been counted in these statistics. I know there are lots of people, if the statistics say one in four is what's reported, I'm guessing it's more like 50%. I'm going to guess it's more like 50% at that study. And when we read about, let me come back and I want to refresh our memory about what this definition is. Um, let's see. Sexual abuse, child sexual abuse is any sexual activity between adults and minors or between two minors when one forces it on the other. This includes touching, non-touching acts like exhibition, exposure to pornography, photography of a child for sexual gratification, solicitation of a child for prostitution, voyeurism, and communication in a verbal way, in a sexual way by phone. And so in 2006, that was the report. Well, so when you just think about what happens uh, through direct messaging and telephone, I'm going to guess that um, we're pretty close to 100%. I'm going to guess, this is just me guessing, so, you know, we're just talking. I'm going to guess that uh, almost 100% of children have experienced somebody being under the age of 18 have had somebody send them a dick pic or a vagina pic. Um, it's so prevalent. Like, honestly, uh, the other day I was working and there was something that came through instant message on Instagram in my professional account and it's a nude. And I'm like, I don't even know. I don't know this. It's in a group. Like, I was Post Institute is tagged in a group. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I, seriously? I was like, I was kind of freaked out, to be honest with you. Like, you know, it's just become so commonplace the brazenness of people approaching others, people they don't even know, they don't know how old they are, they don't know anything about, but they'll just slide up and send any kind of picture that they feel like they want to send. The prevalence of that is, is incredibly high. Um, and then when I think about 
having my own child, I think about times when our house was full of young girls, all of them hanging out, all of them friends, and them talking about like, well, I opened up a Skype account so I could talk to so-and-so, and within 10 minutes of opening my account, I'm being solicited. I had some adult asking to talk to me, somebody I don't even know, and they were like, ew, that was so creepy. So, I think that uh, we're going to find some really interesting information when we get new data. I think new data is going to pretty well blow our minds with regards to how, at what an early age, our children are being exposed to sexual content. Um, I was doing a podcast um, with the folks at Great Parenting Simplified on the topic of pornography, and it's estimated around age eight and nine, about age eight and nine, is when kids first start seeing sexual content on the internet. So last night I was mentioning that we live in a very hyper-sexualized culture and we as adults, um, the internet is educating our children more about human sexuality than parents are. And knowing that your child is likely to see pornography or something sexual, hypersexual, <laughs> by the age of eight, and I don't mean hypersexual like explicit lyrics or a scantily clad, <laughs> scantily clad person, I mean um, nudity, I mean sex, I mean intercourse. So, um, yeah. So we have a big job as parents with regards to teaching our children and helping them um, have some sort of understanding. I think part of this is all coming out of um, just how fast our world is. Um, we have, it, to me, it feels like we have stepped to a place where we are struggling so much with relationship being able to communicate with one another, being able to talk with one another, being able to relate, and yet we still have this very strong biological drive to procreate and our strong biological drive of sexuality. And so that is dangerous because now we're not relating, we're just having sex. And our children are learning about what it means to have sex through what they see on the internet. And that is maybe one way to have sex, but that is certainly not the only way to have sex. And it certainly doesn't address the emotionality. It doesn't address uh, the oxytocin that gets created in your brain. It doesn't address how biologically we are designed to be in relationship based on our if, if not through our consciousness, and if not through our heart posture, through our hormones, we are biologically designed to be in relationship. So I think a lot of times, um, a lot of people really get tangled up, you know, because they're like, I'm trying to do this thing of just having sex, but I have all these feelings. Well, you have all these feelings because we are biologically designed to be in relationship and the act of sex is one of the most intimate acts that two people can engage in together. And it does, it gets all those hormones flowing for that bonding of coupling. That is our biology. So I want to come back though, like here I go into all this other stuff, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what is said in this particular article about um, about abusers, about those who are predators. So, uh, let's see. Who are the predators? And I find it interesting that we can have all these demographics about who the victims are. Like, we, we have, like, age ranges. We have all this gender-specific information. We know about where they live. We know about whether or not their parents are in the workforce. We, I mean, like, we know all this stuff. 
And here's what we know about the predators. Most child sexual abusers are men and may be respected members of the community, drawn to settings where they gain easy access to children like schools, clubs, and churches. They come from all age groups, races, religions, and social socioeconomic classes. Most victims know and trust their abuser. It isn't strangers our children have to fear mostly, according to the Department, uh, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, 21% of all paroled sex offenders in the state of Texas reside in Harris County. I don't know why that's important. Maybe this was an article relative to Texas. But, I mean, all we're getting here is basically um, uh, sexual abusers are more frequently men, but we also know that there are women who are predators. We also know that there are male-female partnerships with regards to the sex trafficking industry that they work in tandem, but we're not talking about that. Like, why are we not getting more information about who the predators are? Um, I kind of, I don't know, call me suspicious. I kind of feel like that's kind of shady. When and how does sexual abuse happen? Many establish a trusting relationship with the victim's family. In order to gain access to the child, perpetrators employ successively inappropriate comments and increasingly inappropriate touches and behaviors. So insidious that the abuse is often well underway before the child recognizes the situ situation as sexual or inappropriate. The first night I was talking about how, you know, uh, the conversation it might start with, um, oh, you sure are cute. You look pretty in that dress. How old are you? Do you have a boyfriend? I'd like to see you in a bikini. Oh, you don't have a bikini? Well, you know, you could just wear pretty panties and bra. That looks just like a bikini. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just like a swimsuit. This progressively, um, the, the progressiveness, the... Uh, we started off tickling, and then the next time he was touching me in my privates over my clothes, and then the next time he was had his hands down my pants or up my dress. The progression. Strategies employed to gain the compliance of victims include the addition and withdrawal of inducements, attention, material goods, and privileges. So it's like, I'm going to give you nice things as long as you're compliant. And then I'll take the nice things away if you're not compliant. Misrepresentation of societal norms and standards and or the abuse of acts themselves and the externalization of responsibility for the abuse onto the victim. Well, if you weren't so pretty, if you didn't have such a sweet body, um, if you weren't wearing that sexy dress uh, everybody's doing it i i saw this person naked and so you know it's not a big deal you know i see a lot of naked people trying to normalize trying to make it seem like it's not a big deal 35% of convicted child molesters use threats of violence to keep children from disclosing the abuse. General threats and physical force are also used to prevent detection. Also threats against family members. Also things like if you tell anyone, it's going to ruin our family. Also, children have a very strong sense of these things. They have a very strong sense about our attitudes, the adult attitudes and feelings about sexuality in general. There's also that piece where we teach children not to let anyone touch them in their private places except a doctor or your parents. And so then when an adult approaches them um, and they're not able to say no because they're just children, and this is an adult, and we've also taught them to respect adults. So there's all these weird mixed messages that we send around all of this. And so if it happens, when it happens, 
it is very frequent that children don't tell because they feel scared. They feel ashamed. Their bodies may have reacted in, in, uh, in ways of arousal because that's what our bodies do. And then they would feel very ashamed and guilty about that. And then the shame and the guilt can perpetuate more of the same behavior. So then it kind of becomes like this, this very self-destructive sort of pattern where guilt and shame, then to alleviate guilt and shame, we engage in activities because there's release kind of like how in the post institute in the book from fear to love we talk about stealing and how stealing is highly addictive we talked about we talk about how self-harm is highly addictive because there's a big rush of endorphins in those activities there's a big buildup of stress and then there's a big release and the same thing can happen with sexual activity there's a big buildup of stress and what research says specifically about pornography, and so I can only assume about other ways of interacting sexually, there's great big huge dopamine spikes. And those dopamine spikes really do a lot of interesting things to our brains. So we'll definitely want to be talking about that more. But I feel like one, I feel like we have a whole lot of more information about people who have, have been victims of sexual abuse. When I am working with people who disclose, and I'll use the term sexual abuse for now because that's the term that our culture uses. So when people, have, when people disclose sexual abuse to me, I don't use that term necessarily. I use whatever term they use. And the reason for that is because there is so, there's so much, it's such a, it's such a thick, there's so much shame and so much conflict about human sexuality. There's so much morality that is this big umbrella and yet so many, so much happens outside of this umbrella of what has been deemed as the morally appropriate way to be sexual. And that is within the confines of marriage, right? That's, that's the big umbrella. And then we have other umbrellas that's like, well, if you're in a relationship, and then we have these other um, umbrellas, it's like, well, you're single, so you can do whatever, as long as you're being safe. Then we have these other umbrellas. So, you know, it's so multi-layered that there's no, there, you know, of course it's confusing. And of course it's confusing to our children. Um, it's, of course it's confusing to our children when they um, are, when they have all this information about how adults are conducting um, themselves in relationship to human sexuality. So, you know, to me, there's no wonder there's, there's, our kids are just like, like what in the world? Like what is, what is the way to go about being healthy with our bodies and with sexuality? Um, I'm concerned that we don't have more concrete information about who these predators are. Um, I find it interesting what we know about the people who are, who have experienced or been victims of sexual abuse. Again, I steer away from those words when I'm talking to people when they disclose that because I don't want to assign victimhood. If they feel as if they are victims, then that's okay. I'm not going to deny that either, but I don't want to assign it. Because feeling like a victim is, that's a tough place to, to come out of. I'm going to simply follow their lead. So if you, if the people who are watching, if you're parents of children who disclose, if you're professionals working in this arena, I encourage you to do your own work because human sexuality is a hot button like we said the first night, as soon as we find out that there is something happening with regards to our children, our young children, and sexuality, we most people, 
I mean, like, I don't know how many people I've talked to, and they're like, oh, they get really freaked out. So I know that's going to happen. Bring it down. Bring it down so that we can have, do your own work. You know, if you had experiences of childhood, sexuality, childhood, if you look at it as child sexual abuse, whatever terminology fits for you, whatever words you use, you, that's your language and that's okay. Um, the system itself does enough to um, invite people to feel like victims that I feel like, especially in that parent-child relationship and in the therapeutic relationship, if that can be a safe place where people can just really talk about whatever their experience was without having to feel as if they're victims, without having to feel shamed or guilty, then that is the healthiest place for healing to take place. You know, if somebody can say, yes, and I feel really ashamed, I felt so sh ashamed about it. I didn't tell anybody for a long time, and I was afraid it was going to ruin my family or see what happened. Then, like, the few, the few stories that I read about um, foster care and adoption and sexual abuse occurring in those environments... The children moved. The children were moved out of those placements. So then can you imagine if you're if you are a foster child or if you've if you're if you've been in the foster system for a long time or if you've been in orphanages for a long time and you finally think this is your forever home, and then they quote unquote rehomed the child. That's messed up, isn't it? so messed up that the only way we can protect in those settings is to quote unquote rehome the child. I don't know how many families I've worked with where when the parent went to report to child welfare of the sexual abuse that was occurring, that the only option that was given was that the offender had to leave the home or the child was going to be removed. And so that's a really tough, I mean, I, I, those are just really tough positions that families get put in. And because families know that, because they, the world knows that that's what's going to happen, that's just one more kind of like one more reason why people don't report. Because as a society, we're not handling it better. We're not handling the protection of our children better. So um, it's, a, it's, God, it's so deep and rich, isn't it? It's so layered and complex. Um, I want to read what Renee said. I uh, just had disclosure from my new from my new foster kiddo. I really needed to hear this today. Oh, I'm so glad that you are listening. I will tell you that I saw several articles about parenting, adoptive parenting, and foster parenting of children who have experienced sexual abuse. I will say that shame can be a very big piece that there can be issues around toileting, bathing, showering, bedtime. There can, all of those things can be triggers. Um, I find that many uh, people who experienced earlier childhood sexual abuse, then when they hit puberty, they get really freaked out. Like it triggers all of that shame. It's like they are now ashamed of having a sexual, being a sexual being, and especially girls when they have their menstrual cycle every month, that just having their period like becomes a big trigger. And so, um, Renee, um, I want to just offer you blessings. I want to offer you um, a calm, peaceful heart. I want to offer you uh, just that soft place, that soft yet stable place for your girl to be able, girl, you said kiddo, so I apologize, for your kiddo to be able to lean into you and for you to be able to be that place of stability that um, she can, that she can lean into. Um, if the disclosure is new, then I know that there will be There'll be much more to come. Um, and uh, just that my, my most loving, compassionate thoughts 
are with you guys and anyone else who's walking this out, um, whether you're walking it out as a parent, whether you're walking it out just as a, as a person who's experienced early childhood sexual abuse, if you're a person who um, has, is a survivor, um, we're going to talk more about how these experiences can mold how we perceive ourselves and how it can affect our relationships later down the line. So, um, so I'll just take a great big deep breath. And believe that love is healing because it is. Love truly is healing. So let's pour great, 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 great big amounts of love into one another. We know that these experiences, this is a, these traumatic shame creating experiences can create havoc for our children and their neurology. And so you be their safe person. And part of being their safe person means that you know that they need to feel your love and they need you to be one of the few, if there's not been anybody else in their world who loves them without expecting them to do something that bypasses their soul. You know, if you have a child who's kind of got a big fuck you attitude, maybe that's, maybe that's part of it. Maybe part of their attitude is because everybody that they have been in relationship from the adult world has demanded something from them that felt like it was compromising them. That there hasn't been anyone who just loved them unconditionally without taking from them. And they need that. They need that. They need your eyes to shine with adoration. They need your eyes to say, I love you. I don't care how hard the day has been. You put all that aside. Put it all aside. Plus pause on anything you've been stressed out and worried about. Take some deep breaths and remember, they've been through some things. Build that empathy muscle. <laughs> and go spend time with them. Whatever it looks like. Let them lead. Whether you're playing, whether you're playing a game, whether you're, you know, I say wrestling around on the floor because kids love that so much. But as we're talking about this particular issue about sexual behavior and, and sexual abuse, um, your child may not, that may not feel safe to your child. That not, Sadly, they may not, they may sit on the sidelines watching you do that with other children in your family. And they may have, there may be a part of them that just really wants to get in there and play. But just can't because they're afraid they're going to freak out or you're going to touch their boo-boo or their nookie. Whatever crazy words people have given to their vagina and their bottom. So, or they may jump in. They might jump in and play. And then in that play, they might get aroused. And they may do something that's inappropriate. And then when that happens, you lovingly say, we don't have sex with children in our family. We don't do that in this house. In this house, adults don't have sex with children. Things you may have never thought you would need to say. If you need to rub your privates, you can go in your bedroom and do that. We don't do that in the living room. We don't hump pillows. <laughs> this is real life. These are real things that happen. We don't masturbate the dog. It's okay to say these things. It's okay to gain the language to just be honest, loving, and authentic as you guide and direct these children who've already been through shit they have never should have been through in the beginning. Be a person who is willing to love them unconditionally and give them the guidance that they never gained and guiding them through things that they have been exposed to and loving them through all of it. So go play with your babies. Love them. Enjoy them. Let the love you have from them shine from your eyes. Let them feel it from your body. Let them know in your actions that they are safe. That they are safe and loved in your home. The most important 
bottom pieces of our foundation of human development is safety and security. Your children may not have had much of that before now. You providing safety and security is a big deal. And I know in any given moment, we can get stressed out and overwhelmed and we can act out of those blueprints of stress and fear and overwhelm, or we can take one to two to three deep breaths and we can choose love. Much love to you guys. I hope you all have a blessed evening. We'll see you all tomorrow night.